Blog Talk Radio. about everything that I thought groomers needed to know within the DVDs. And I have several DVDs on different techniques and included most of the most common breeds and some mixed breeds and show trims and things like that. And, you know, the the DVD series has been so extremely popular and is being used in grooming schools all over the country, which is just great for me. Um, But, you know, I still have gotten countless emails over the years People that have my DVD series, you know, you, you know, certain people like certain um, people's teaching styles, and I find that the people that have my DVDs really like my style, and so I find that they keep coming back to me looking for new material. So I've had countless people say, "Do you have a grooming book? Do you have a book? I like your style. I, you really need to have a book." <laughs> so I decided to write this book to complement my DVD series so they could go hand in hand. So that's pretty much the reason why I started it, just by um, the demand of my followers. So I started this book. uh, Go ahead. I started this probably about four years ago, um, and it's it's been quite a project. It's probably been my, my most valuable accomplishment I've ever done. I mean, it's been pretty phenomenal. I know what it's like to write books, and you're writing <laughs> almost, uh, you, you, you're you constantly in this mode of 24 hours a day. Uh, yeah, boy, yeah, ex- just looking exactly. that day that it's all together and edited and whatever. But, of course, you yeah. had even another dimension to your book in that um, you really made some as I can see from the pictures I've seen already, you went with photography on this one. Tell what was that like getting all those pictures together? Well, yeah, that was probably harder than actually writing the book. <laughs> but I'll tell you the reason why I did it. The the one thing that I wanted in this book, um, and I knew for sure that I wanted, was real photos because, you know, I'm pretty much self-taught. 
So I went, I became a mobile groomer after I was only grooming about a year. So I really didn't know anything. I, I knew nothing about breed standards, and I knew nothing about why I was doing what I was doing. So the only, And I didn't have any friends that were groomers, so I didn't really have anybody to go to to ask for advice. And, of course, back then, that was almost 18 years ago, that we didn't have Internet, <laughs> you know. So it was, there was no other way to learn except to go out there and get the information you needed. And so I would go to dog shows. Every time there was a local dog show in the area, I would go, and I would walk around, and I would look at the dogs to see what they were supposed to look like. And that's how I taught myself, by visually going out there and looking. And um, I remember, you know, bringing home, you know, you get the free magazines, show magazines while you're at the show, the Chronicle or Dogs in Review. And I used to bring those magazines home, and I would put them in my van. And every time I came to a breed I wasn't sure about, I would open it up, and look for that dog, whether it be a schnauzer or whatever, and I would mimic that show trim. And I would do that by the pictures. And so to me, that's how I taught myself. And those pictures were were so much easier to follow than going through other grooming books that were available back then because it really didn't teach me anything. I couldn't see the coat. I couldn't see the clipper work. I couldn't see the dimensions to see how to do it. It was really hard to follow, so it was easier for me to look at real photos. So I knew that that's what I wanted my book to be. So I wanted, because it's all how I taught myself, and I I just wanted to be able to share that and share that knowledge because that, to me, was invaluable. Now, you've also, from what I've seen, because I have not reviewed the inside of the book yet, but it looks like you had uh, someone... With the you know good experience, you're you're using shading on parts of the pets, which is a and there's a legend. Those are the blade numbers, I believe, is what. I yeah. Mean. How did that well, out? well, what I did was well going back to the photography uh, just for a minute. Um, I actually started taking a lot of the photos myself, and I started going to dog shows and trying to gather photos, and it was really you know it was difficult because a lot of the handlers didn't want to give you the time of day and let you take photos of their dogs and so you'd have to get them ringside or you know and and try to get them that way so it really became a challenge and I remember I was um at Sally Sally Hawk's house one day and her, her and Marjorie Good were there and I was getting photos of their Sealy and Marjorie said to me you know there are so many beautiful photos to be had out there she said you know, why don't you, you know, talk to some of these photographers that are taking these beautiful photos, like, you know, Sky, the wire fox terrier that just won Westminster, um, the photographer that takes all her photos is Miguel Betancourt, and he's the one that took those beautiful pictures of the Scotty Sadie that has been out there, um, too, and these are pictures that are just, just gorgeous, and so I actually called him up, and I said, you know, I really need some pictures of Sadie and, and, and um, Sky, you know, would I be able to, you know, grab some photos from you? And after talking to him for a little while on the phone, he said to me the same exact thing that Marjorie Good said, don't you want, this is your book, don't you want these photos to all be consistent and to have that beautiful image of the breed? And I said, yeah, of course, because I'm not a photographer, you know, I'm just doing my best to get these photos. And so he offered to take on the entire project for me. So I jumped at the opportunity. So Miguel is the photographer, and he got me all these gorgeous photos. And so they are, they're stunning. So, I mean, a picture is worth a, a thousand words, and he did beautiful work. So, um, so then what we did from there, my son, Devin, is actually a graphic designer, and he's just finishing up his fourth year in school right now. And so, you know, Dave – my boyfriend Dave said to me, because we were going through, how are we going to diagram these dogs, you know? What, how are we going to do this? So Dave said, well, you know, too big you can't do something with color. And so I talked to my son Devin, and I said, you know, what can we do with color? What can we do? And so Devin started, you know, playing around with the photos, and he actually, um, you know, did all the diagramming for me. And it was quite a project. And, and you know, between him and Miguel, I'm, they're both, like, so glad this is over because <laughs> It was a lot of work for both of them. Um, but, you know, so Devin did all the lines on all the dogs, and what we did was um, we separated, you know, the shoulder. We separated the throat, the body pattern, the thigh muscles. We separated all that by color. And then there's a little chart on the bottom of each breed um, 
that shows what blade or, or snap-on comb or technique, whatever applies to that breed, what to use on that particular color. So if you're doing an Irish setter, you, you look at if the shoulder is, is purple, you're going to look in the purple box, and it says to use a 5 or a 7. So it's going to tell you in the color chart what to use on that part of the dog. And they're all what I would recommend to use. Every, everything that's in there, it gives you several choices, um, depending on what length you want to take the dog, but it's all what I would recommend. And um, so it's very easy. So now when, you, when you're finished looking at the breed, you'll see the profile, the front and rear, and all those um, photos will be in color, and you can just pick the, pick the blade that I recommend to use on that part of the dog. So it's going to be it's very easy to follow. Jody, what, what other note? Let's take an, uh, just one breed. We'll just select Airedale. Um, what else? Per breed, now, you've got the photograph, you've got this legend with the overlay. What what's the text? Uh, what, what did you discuss for each one? Okay, well, general? you know, this is the whole the whole theory of this book is to make it as simple to understand as possible. And you know, when I first started this book, you know, four years ago, I really didn't have a definitive plan as where I was going with it. But as I started to do breed by breed, I started to realize that. I'm saying the same thing over and over and over again. And it's almost like these breeds are all groomed in the same manner. And it all comes down to the structure of the dog. And so in the beginning of my book, I actually have a chapter on structure. And it's basic structure. But that's how I teach. I teach on uh, on the structure. And, you know, it's, you set the patterns based on the structure of the dog. So, you know, the front is, you know, clipped to the breastbone. The rear angulation is the, to the bend of the leg. And the top line is scissored level or whatever the case may be. Um, the tuck up is, is under the last strip. All these dogs are groomed in the same manner. And it's all based on their structure. And, you know, so I really emphasize the basic structure knowledge because it's so important for groomers to really understand. And if you understand those structure points, you can groom anything with ease. And the examples that I give are, um, for instance, you know, look at people. We all have the same bones. We all have the same bones, but we all look different. Some people are petite. Some people are short. Some people are tall. Some people are heavier boned. We, and that's what makes us all unique because our, our bone structure is slightly different as far as length and mass goes. Our muscle tone is different. And it's the same thing for dogs. Dogs have the same exact bones. And what makes each breed unique is the length of bones they have, the mass of bones, and their coat type. That was, that's what makes their their unique picture. And if you look at a dachshund, for instance, you know, the whole, you know, front assembly and rear assembly on the dachshund is smaller than other breeds, say, like a poodle, because those that upper arm has to be short. You know, they have to dig through burrows. I mean, that's what they were bred to do. So they rest their chest on the ground, and they use those little short legs to dig. You couldn't put a poodle in a burrow. They could never you couldn't even put a little toy poodle in a burrow because they don't even ha they don't have those short little legs to be able to dig. So each each breed is is made up of the bone structure that's going to suit their um, utility, what they were bred to do. But they're all the same. I mean, look at a little chihuahua or a little minkin. You know, their their bones are petite and they're they're you know they're they're small. But then you look at you know, say a Mastiff or, you know, a Newfoundland, and, you know, you look at them and they've got heavier bone, longer bones, but they're all the same bones. So, you know, if you look at, say, um, you know, a Wheaton and a Bouvier, you know, it's like they have different coat types, but it's almost like the same trim, but it's on a different build. So you're setting the pattern lines in the same exact manner. You're setting your shoulder layback, you're setting your top line, you're setting your underline, but their build and their bone structure is what changes and makes it unique. So what I have found is to really simplify this whole learning process by categorizing the breeds in the pattern that they fall. So I, I designed three different groups um, um, when I called them, and it's by the similarity of the trim. So um, I have a setter-like pattern, I have a terrier-like pattern, and then I have my sculpted body trims. And whether the dog is a working dog or a herding dog or a toy or, or a sporting dog, it doesn't matter. They are going to be grouped in that category based on their trim. 
So what I do is I describe the entire trim in detail. I take one breed and I describe the front. I describe the shoulder, the the profile, the thigh, the rear. I describe it in in detail. And then I go and I, I, I show all the breeds that fall under that category. Um, and then, you know, of course, I have profile front and rears of every single breed. And then I have the um, the color diagram that tells you what to use on, on that body part. So it's very easy. And I think once you once groomers really understand structure and what I'm getting at, I mean, you can groom any breed, any breed with ease, doing it that way. Because, you know, with over 190 breeds, if, you know, it's overwhelming for a new groomer to say, oh, I have to learn, you know, 190 haircuts. No, you don't, because, you know, they're all groomed in the same fashion. You know, it's almost like one haircut, <laughs> you know. It's just different coat types and different coat lengths. It's what changes the trims and makes these dogs um, unique to their own breed. Great. That's a good answer. I, I'm anxious now to really see how you've done that and done this grouping. So, and we should say here, uh, I haven't mentioned yet, the name of the book is Dog Grooming Simplified, straight to the point. So that's what yeah. you've done, and that's uh, an interesting approach to an entire uh, grooming instruction book that what, as you said, it's over 190 breeds are covered in that? No. Well, that's we have almost 190 recognized oh, AKC breeds. Yeah, I mean, those are the breeds I recognize. Now, the breeds that I don't cover in the book are breeds that don't have a pattern. So I don't cover the short-coated breeds, and I don't cover I don't cover the breeds that are in full coat, like a Bearded Collie or a Shih Tzu, Yorkie, Maltese. The dogs that, for AKC, should be in full coat, I don't cover. But what I do in the end of my book is I show how to put these different pattern lines on those breeds. Right. That's, that's so I have idea. I have about yeah I have about seventy seventy breeds that show um, show the pattern. So and all the newer breeds like the Black Russian and the um, you know a lot of the the newer recognized breeds are in there too. So. But you know you know what's oh, funny what, is that about? I remember when so, go ahead. No 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 go ahead go ahead. Um, I remember when, you know, a couple of years ago, my daughter Mackenzie was working and um, she uh, called me and she said, um, I have this Airedale on my table. Where do I set these lines? And so I was, you know, trying to describe to her, you know, where to set them and everything. And, and so a week later, she calls me back and she said, Mom, I have this Welsh Terrier on my table. How do I set these lines? And I said, Mackenzie, you just asked me last week how to, how to do a... Um, an Airedale, and she goes, yeah, I know. And I said, it's the same trim, <laughs> you know, <laughs> different breed, same trim. So, you know, the, over the years of teaching groomers and hearing the things that I I had been hearing, I realized, you know, how it, it's almost like, you know, that light bulb has to go on. You have to realize that these trims are all done in the same fashion, you know, and it just really makes a huge difference when you understand understand structure and you know talking about structure too i remember i i used to go to different breeders and handlers uh for lessons a lot when i was learning and i was at a cocker spaniel um breeder's house one time and i didn't know the first thing about structure no one ever taught me about structure so i um she kept saying you know well you know if you if you set this uh, chest like this will give this dog more chest and this dog needs more undulation. And, and I, you know, I felt stupid asking questions because, you know, I, she was so confident in what she was saying and I didn't have a clue what she was talking about. So finally I said to her, you know, I just don't really understand. What do you mean about the front? I mean, why doesn't this dog have a, a good front? It looks good to me, you know? And so she looked at me and she went, wait a minute, let me just show you something. So she went in the panel she grabbed another dog. She put it on the table, and she says, feel this chest. Feel this front. Do you feel how this chest comes down to the elbow? Do you feel this breastbone? Feel that breastbone pops? Now feel this dog. And once I put my hands on the dogs, and once I, I understood what she was talking about, it's like that light bulb went on. And then she would say, now, look at this dog's rear. Feel this rear angulation. See where the see where the bones are and she would show me and then she'd bring another dog up and she'd say now feel this dog look at this dog's rear you see how straight it is in the rear and then it was like oh now I see it but it's almost like 
you know, you need somebody to just make that light bulb turn on for you. And, you know, sometimes you can talk, people can talk until they're blue in the face and you just don't get it. But if you if you have an opportunity to, to do that, like I did, it's, I mean, that's how I, that's how I, ta- I was taught how to groom, by really talking to these breeders and going for lessons because they're the ones that really helped me to understand structure. So it's, I, I really hope that this um, this book really makes a difference because um, I know it did for me. So I have everything and all the ways that I was taught are in this book, so I'm hoping that it really will help. You know, you use the term, and I know, uh, Jody, we get plenty of beginners just thinking about grooming that come to the site and listen to the show. Uh, groomer silos often use the term set the lines. Could you just uh, give them an idea of what you mean? Because they may think you draw on the dog, you just slice it here, whatever. What, what do you? What do you? What does well, the stylus mean when you say set the lines? Set the lines. Is, is yes, that what you, said? you often you use that term. Do you, how or you? Uh, how do you set the lines? Can you explain? Well, what well, that means? But, well, when I speak about the lines, I mean like the top line to set that straight top line or the arch or to set where your um, your shoulder is, where to set your underline. I mean, to set those particular lines where they're supposed to be on the dog. You know, if you're and setting so you're your lines. doing that visually. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're trying to set the the lines of the front legs so they're they're parallel, you're you're setting. It's just the, the way that you're actually setting the um, the silhouette of the dog. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I just want that up because I've heard that question asked many times, even on the board. Over, how do you guys set the lines? It's also, what do you mean by set the lines? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just setting the the silhouette, so setting the profile and the lines of the dog. You know, the lines, the angulation. Um, you know, uh, the way that the front is the the front is set, where the front legs are set under under the chest. It's all the the outline of the dog. Great. Now, what do you? What about? Um, how does it change if the dog is very obese? What does that do to the lines? And what? What well, do you recommend to groomers when dealing with a, well, some fault styling things like that? Well, I actually have a chapter on um, correcting faults because, granted, all the dogs that are, are pictured in my book are all really good specimens of the breed because they're all show dogs. Um, but I chose to illustrate show dogs because I want to show what the breed should look like. And I want you to be able to see um, the correct coat. And I want you to be able to see, like if you have a um, a terrier, for instance, I want you to be able to see there's no line. There's no clipper line. Everything looks like it grew that way. So that's why I chose to use show dogs because I want – I want people to see a Cocker Spaniel doesn't have a straight line running across from the shoulder to the hip. So they don't have that in the show ring. It looks like it grew that way. So that's the vision that I want groomers to have. But now our pets, of course, aren't going to look like that. So, But if you have a vision of correct and you have a vision of what that dog's supposed to look like, you can mimic that. And if it's a dog that is heavy, a lot of our pets are chunky. Leaving too much hair on those dogs is going to make them look heavier. So if you've got, you know, a, um, whatever, say, a wheat and that's really heavy, I'm not going, I'm going to take a t- I'm going to make that body tighter because the tighter you make the body, the leaner it's going to look. But if you, if you use, say, you know, a three-quarter inch comb or a one-inch comb on the body because that's, you know, what I recommend to use on a, on a, on a pet trim, but if you have a really heavy set dog, I would say use a tighter comb and take some of that volume off of the body because that's going to make the dog look slimmer. And it's even the other way around. If you've got a dog that's really skinny, you would leave more coat to make it look more pleasing to the eye. So there's a lot of things that you can do to correct structural faults or even just, you know, weight problems. So I do have a whole section in there um, about, you know, different techniques on, on how to um, you know, fix little issues because, you know, I'm not saying that all these pets need to be groomed like show dogs. I'm not saying that at all because, you know, your pet trims, you want them to be um, 
you know, manageable for the pet owners. But the only thing that really should change is the length of coat, the length of furnishings. You can still do an Irish setter, and you can still set the lines of an Irish setter, the clipper work, and um, the head, and, you know, to to the breed profile. And then you can just, you know, modify the length of, of furnishings um, to suit the pet owner's needs. And I talk about that throughout the entire book. You know, the patterns should always be the same, and the length of furnishings is what can be really modified. So, you know, that's um, that's talked about throughout the whole book. So, How about, uh, is there a, a bit of material on mixed breeds and how I could look at this mixed breed and perhaps understand which of the other instructions well, you provide and I would apply to that mixed breed? Well, I have several, um, I have a section in the back that's called, uh, in the back of the book called Mixing It Up. And I actually take um, the different patterns that have been discussed throughout the book, and I put them on Shih Tzu's and uh, Yorkies and um, a cockapoo, and I have a lot of poodle crosses in there. Um, and I show you how to put these different patterns on different breeds. And that's the greatest thing about this book is by the time you get to that section, you can, you'll can you see how you can apply the whole theory that I'm giving in this book, you can apply to any breed at all. And so, I mean, that's, that's – and I give you examples in the back of how to do that. And I have a whole section in um, in my book on head styles because, you know, uh, you know there, you've got your rectangular heads, you've got your round heads, you've got your, um, your sporting dog heads, and those are the three – head styles are basically the same. I mean, a round head is a round head, and a rectangular head is a rectangular head. Now, you might have different coat types that are going to change how you would achieve that head. Say you have um, a Wheaton that has more of a drop coat, a a silkier coat, and you're going to achieve that rectangular head a little differently than if you were going to do, say, a wire fox. So I have those sections in my book, and I describe how to achieve a rectangular head, and then I show you the different different types of rectangular heads there are. So, why do you have to learn how to how to do an Airedale head, a Welsh head, a you know all the different rectangular heads, you know, as individuals when it's, it's a rectangle's a rectangle, and if you understand you know how to achieve it, you just change your techniques according to that coat type. So, um, and I did that with my round heads, and I did that with my sporting dog heads. So. Um, so it's all about, you know, simplifying things. And don't feel like you have to learn every single breed. If you just learn, you know, the proper techniques to achieve that, that head style, then that's what that's all you need to do. So I actually what I did was when I when I go into um I have went into ear styles and I have clipped ears or natural ears and things like that and then I actually show you some pet trims on clipping ears on different breeds and, you know, and how how nice it looks, you know, on mixed breeds and things like that. So I, you can apply everything that I, I'm teaching in this book, you can apply to a lot of different breeds. I've had several people ask, uh, by the way, um, if you're going to be taking this to the shows this summer, will you have copies available? Um, I'm actually not going to be anywhere until Hershey because I'm going to London next week um, to do some seminars. And so I won't be at the shows in August, but I will be in Hershey and I will also be um, in Rhode Island. Great. That's good to know. There's a lot of them will be at Hershey. That's a good one to have it at. So there's that answer. Yeah. I have both emails yeah. on that. I mean, uh, but we, we've had... Uh, we've, you know, really, I, I was hoping that this book would have been released in April, and um, we've had so many setbacks that it's it's been very frustrating, and I want to just thank everybody that's been so patient um, for this book to come out. But, you know, being that we're working with, uh, photogra- with photography of real dogs, it's been really difficult because of the weather. And I know Miguel has the last few shows that he had planned to go to gather the, the last handful of breeds you know it's either been raining or it's too windy and then if it's too windy the coat is being blown all over and he would come home from the show and say i couldn't get any photos and i was like oh no you know so i think he had like four shows in a row that he could not get any photos so it was so frustrating and 
Um, so we've had several setbacks, which has really delayed the release of the book. But, you know, I ju- it just needs to be perfect. And, you know, Miguel was sending me photos, and I would say, oh, I really don't like that dog. <laughs> you know? And he would go, what do you mean you don't like that dog? <laughs> See, Miguel, it has to be perfect. It really does. I don't like this dog. <laughs> so he's like, Joey, you're such a perfectionist. <laughs> you know? It's like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> it just has to be perfect. Yeah. So. You know, so I just, um, we've really, really uh, gone the extra mile to make this perfect. So it's, well, it's going to be well, well worth the it, wait. So. It's absolutely groundbreaking to have a photography. I mean, everyone for, what, decades has, you know, I've, I've, I'm going to do a, an instruction book on grooming. I want photography. And, it, I mean, look what you went through, just that you've made this happening with uh, real photography, yeah. that's a new standard. And I, I can't imagine all that you've probably gone to do that. So some people may be hearing this for the first time, our career secrets and all. It's really just groundbreaking to have a book yeah. with this much photography. It just hasn't been done before. No, no, and it, it is. It's gonna, it, it has been probably the the hardest thing that we've ever done, but uh, but it really all came together well. And, you know, when I was... When I was starting to take pictures on my own, I started um, my group on Facebook, I think it's like three years ago now, uh, called Critique Your Groom. And I did that for a reason because I wanted to be able to show photos. And so when girl, when the girls would, would post photos of a schnauzer and say, you know, can you check this and what, what would you do? I would post one of my photos that I took at a dog show and I would I would – if they were talking about a rear, I would post a rear, and I would post a front, and to post a profile, and and the responses that I were getting were just phenomenal. And that's when I realized that I was on the right track. When I realized how how positive and the and how it was really helping people understand by me posting these photos, that I just knew that this was this was going to be a good thing. So um, that's actually my group started while I was doing all these photos myself. And um, so, I mean, the group is just phenomenal now, and it's really taken off, and people are just learning from it and learning from the um, the photos. So these photos are a thousand times better than my photos that I took. So <laughs> so they're, um, it's going to be a great reference. And the other thing that I did in this book, which has never really been done before, I actually had to go to all the AKC breed clubs that I was uh, – um, of the briefs that I have in my book, and I had to get written permission to quote parts of their breed standard. And that was an ordeal in itself. And I um, wow. was very adamant about about quoting the breed standard because, you know, when, when groomers go to the AKC book and they look up the standards, it's very overwhelming. There's a lot of information in the AKC book that is geared for breeders, um, you know, to breed the, to breed the correct, dog and so a lot of it does not pertain to groomers so what i did was i went into this standard and i pulled out the information that i felt groomers needed to know um the important parts of the standard and so that's all incorporated under each breed as well that's excellent uh, again a, a lot of overwhelming amount of work just to just to compile all yeah. that yeah, well, yeah, uh, it, it it has been for sure. So. so where are people going to be able to find a copy when you're ready? They can uh, Well, I'm hoping order to have it in Jody Murphy. Yeah, it will be on my website um as soon as it's available. I I hope to have it in my hands by the end of this month. Um it actually um had more setbacks with the design. Um, the person that did the design, the layout of the book, I wasn't happy with it once I received it. So I had to go to a different designer. And I thought, you know, this has been four long years of my life, and I'm not just going to settle with, with this layout. The layout, I, it just wasn't what I was looking for. So I had to turn around and, and give it to somebody else. So these are just all the setbacks that I've had. So, um, But it, I am hoping to have it in my hands um, by the end of this month. So I will ship it as soon as it's available. And for those of you that may be listening to this recording in the future, uh, she's talking July 2014 when we're recording yes. this call. So it should be by the end of July 2014. That's not long from now. 
Yeah, yeah, no, and it should be any time now. We're just wrapping it up, so it should be available very soon. Are you going to do autograph copies of Hershey? Oh, yes, definitely, yeah. Okay. I've had so many people, you know, pre-order the book um, on my website I had, and at um, a couple of shows, and so though so they will be the first books that go out, and um they will be, take priority before um, I put it on my site because they these people have been so patient and waiting for this release, so they will get the first copies, and then it will be available on my website. Well, it must be around 400 pages, correct? Yeah, it's about 450 pages, actually. So. Oh, 450 pages. Yeah, and it's, yeah, <laughs> in full color, so, <laughs> so yeah, it's going to be quite a book. Yeah, yeah. That's what. Well, what else? What now? You said you're going to London. All. What do you? What do you? Let's find out. Catch up with you. What else? Now that you have all this time, your book is done. What are you doing? I know. I'll tell you. It's like I'm kind of enjoying myself finally. You know, I've been, I've been really. I'm not kidding. The graphic designer that's been working on stuff. She she works until three in the morning. So I'm up at all hours of the night answering her her you know emails and and things and so it, it's been just grueling <laughs> so it's been so nice I've been yeah. kind of enjoying my summer and you know went fishing one day finally and being able to just sit in the sun and oh my gosh I feel like I just want to take like a year off and do nothing <laughs> I understand I understand so, I'm yeah, so very not, similar art. yeah so I'm for, looking I've forward to going I'm looking forward to going to London. I'll be traveling with uh, Danelle German. Her and I will be going to the uh, Festival of Grooming in uh, London. We're both doing seminars there. So we'll be there um, next week. So it should be a lot of fun. What did she think of, of all the color photos and all that? You know, I, I, that's something I know would kill her. I, I wonder if we're going to see a, a cat grooming book out of her all done in color like this. Be I know. Well, she, she, I don't, maybe well, she, has, she hasn't. She hasn't. She hasn't seen anything yet. So, um, <laughs> in fact, you were you were the first wor- person to actually see the color diagram that I sent you of the Airedale. So, uh, it's pretty. It's pretty nice. Yeah. And um, I'm very, very proud of my son Devin for doing all that work. It was a lot of work, and um, he did it while he was in school. And he goes to uh, Binghamton University, and He's about two hours from me, and I would drive up there on the weekends and spend time with him and go, th- you know, because those lines had to be done with me sitting with them because they had to be in the right spot, you know. And so um, it was it was quite a lot of work for him, too, and he did a fabulous job. So I was very happy with everybody. I've worked with wonderful designers, and it's just been really a great experience. Well, we certainly congratulate you. We look forward to seeing this, and uh, I think you should do very well with it. I'm sure word's going to get around. Uh, yeah. Those for hand. Uh, I hope so. Oh, so, how are I, things going here with with your DVDs? You're pretty much complete with the center. Do you have a couple new ones you're thinking about doing? Anything? Yeah, I mean, we um, we actually had this on hold. You know, we haven't done a lot of new releases because I've been spending every waking moment on this book. So uh, we have a couple um, things that we want to do. We have a, a rescue organization that we're going to be um, working with here. Um, so you know, we're gonna we're gonna come up with some some new things and. Um, kind of focus on some mixed breed trends and things like that. I had a new release um, a couple months ago called the Shag, and that's a cute um, layer trim that I do on a sheet too, a, a longer layer trim with bell-bottom legs and, um, you know, beveled cocker feet, so it's real cute. And uh, that one was the newest release. We also have a, a, re- a release called Expressions, with which consists of 10 different head styles. So those are the most two recent um, releases that we have. But hopefully we'll get right. get some more going now that I can put the book behind me and move on to other things. So. Yep, you can have some of your life back again. 
I am. Yeah. And I know when my mother did her book, it was a little over three years, and people don't realize it really is seven days a week when you do these kind of things. Because yeah, even it, if it really stay is. Off, you're still thinking about this thing. And you get, yeah. I got yeah, to move there... all this and go, uh, yeah. It, yeah, it's so, I mean, uh, you know. There is no day off, you know. It, you can't sleep at no. night. <laughs> you, know? you just can't. Yeah. But, um, but you know, the other yeah. great thing about this book is because I incorporate uh, the breed standard in with these breeds, you know, there's so much now going on with licensing, and there's so many groomers now wanting to certify. And the information that is going to be in this book with these breeds is going to answer so many questions um, and prepare people for certification and, and testing because it's a lot of information um, So and all the information that you really need to know. Well, it certainly helps lift uh, the professional reputation of our industry. We've had, you know, some other champion groomers like yourself, as you know, that have been coming out with products. Just think of 10 years ago how little we had it, and you're one right. right on the top there along with some other great groomers who have really helped our industry hugely because yeah. it's something that will last forever. Yeah. Downline. Yeah. It's going to be there's and that's, the information. Now, get it. And, and you know, and that's, that's the reason why I have such a passion for education is just because of how hard it was for me. I mean, I had, there were no, there was no material out there and there was no internet and, and, you know, and I had to go and travel on my days off. I with three little kids at the time and my kids were young when I first started grooming and um, I used to go on my day off and work with breeders and handlers and, and, you know, really perfect my skills. And I, um, and like I said, going to dog shows and whatnot. And so everything that I, I've learned, I've learned from some of the top people in the industry. And um, so it's been, it's been a great um, experience, but in the same breath, it, I put all this material together um, to make it easier for people to learn and to get, to get the correct information out there and the correct techniques. And that's why I started the whole DVD series. And I'm just so, so, you know, happy that the grooming schools are using the series and their curriculum. It's just really great. So, and, you know, my, my teaching style, I, I always teach as though the viewer knows nothing. Um, but I teach at a high skill level. So even the seasoned groomer will learn from my techniques because the techniques that, that I teach um, will teach all levels. So, and I, I always have a reason why I do what I do. And I always explain what would happen if you did it a different way. So that's my style, and um, it's always always gone over very well. And I think a lot of people um, can um, learn easily from that type of style. So, okay, Jody, uh, let's let's tell people. Uh, why don't you go ahead and give them your website? I think that would be the number one contact for them to, or perhaps your Facebook page. Why don't you tell them, what, how can they contact you about this? Um, my website is jodymurphy.net, J-O-D-I, uh, murphy.net. Uh, my email is jodymurphyonline at yahoo.com. Now, I also have a mailing list on my website, so if you go to the Contact um, Us page, you can put in your email address, and I will send out um, a mass email to people. Whenever I have new releases of anything, I, I try to send out a um, constant contact email to people. So if you want to get on my mailing list, you can do that. You can check the website by the end of this month, but I will put a... Um, I usually put announcements on Facebook as well as uh, send out an email to everyone that's on my list. Great. And we'll be sure to let everyone know over at Groomer Talk 2 when it's actually available. And in the meantime, I want you to have a good time in London. Take a break. You deserve it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Yeah, it should be fun. Yeah. Okay, and say hi to Danelle for all of us, too. She is <laughs> I will. Another great contributor. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she's great. Well, thank you. Thank you for being with us. Okay, Stephen, thanks so best. much. Thank you. Uh-huh. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Celebrate St. Patrick's Day by saving some green at your friendly neighborhood Albertsons. For a delicious dinner, save on St. Patrick's Day favorite Signature Farms corned beef brisket, boneless point cut, just $1.79 a pound with in-ad coupon. Limit two packages while supplies last. And for a sweet snack, Mystic Treat Seedless Grapes large two-pound packages are only $2.99 each for a limited time. Tastier meats, sweeter produce, bigger savings. Albertson, it's just better. 